Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the panel on yeah. innovation, which I think is very uh, appropriate for a conference titled The Future of Finance. My name is James Choi. I am a professor of finance here at the School of Management. I'm joined by uh, three great speakers uh, who will be uh, speaking in turn. So we'll do 10 minutes uh, for each speaker, and then we'll open up to audience Q&A. So directly to my left is my colleague, Ziwu Chen. He is a professor of finance at the School of Management, also received his PhD in finance at Yale. He is a well-known expert on China. Uh, he was named uh, among the top 10 most influential Chinese economists by China's Wall Street Wire. Uh, China's Time Weekly named him one of the 10 public intellectuals who are influencing China. The PR agency Burston Marsteller named him one of China's 10 most influential political voices on Weibo, which is the Chinese equivalent of Twitter. I had a Chinese grad student uh, go look up Ziwu's account on Weibo, and he has 10.6 million followers on Weibo. Just to give you a sense of what that means, uh, if I looked at the number of Twitter followers of various celebrities, and Ziwu has more Weibo followers than The Economist has on uh, Twitter, Shaquille O'Neal and Stephen Colbert. <laughs> so, uh, so Ziwu uh, has, has a, a very far-reaching uh, influence. Uh, then uh, in the middle, it, we have uh, Leng, Ling Feng Li, who is a portfolio manager at Capula Investment Management, a hedge fund with $10 billion under management. He has a PhD in economics from Yale, and he co-manages the Japanese yen and US dollar fixed income portfolios, as well as the macro trading portfolio as a fund. Uh, prior to Capula, he worked at Oak Hill Platinum Partners, where he managed the Asian portfolios and helped man, uh, grow the assets under management to $5 billion, making it one of the largest fixed income hedge funds in the world. Finally, uh, we have Dean Carlin, who is a professor of economics at Yale. He is the president and founder of Innovations for Poverty Action, a nonprofit organization dedicated to discovering and promoting effective solutions to global poverty problems. He is a founder of Stick.com, a website that uses insights from behavioral economics to help people uh, achieve their personal goals by uh, entering into commitment contracts where people agree to uh, some sort of financial penalty or some other kind of penalty if they don't meet their goals. Uh, also, the director of the Financial Access Initiative, a consortium of researchers that are focused on expanding access to financial services uh, for uh, low-income individuals. So I'll turn it over to Zewa first, and then we'll kind of go in turn. Uh, thank, uh, first of all, thank you, James, for the uh, big introduction. Uh -huh. um, so let me uh, focus my 10 minutes on, on the politics of, uh, financial, of financial innovations. I, I know as someone who started uh, 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 his career uh, first uh, from finance theory, uh, I cannot help but think that uh, mathematically, uh, there are infinitely many possible uh, financial contracts or securities that we can design. Uh, but the, the reality is that uh, not so many financial innovations uh, have really uh, survived, let alone uh, having a large impact on the larger society. So why is that the case? Why uh, most, most financial innovations uh, don't really uh, work out? I know the, the, uh, uh, the um, academic field has uh, done a lot of, of work to uh, look at the impact of asymmetric information and agency uh, problems uh, that tend to make uh, many, many uh, financial contract designs or security designs not really work. Uh, but not as much attention has been paid to uh, the influence of politics on uh, why uh, some financial innovations fail and others uh, tend to succeed. Uh, I'm talking about this mainly, as many of you may have read uh, in recent uh, days, uh, that the, the Chinese government has basically uh, killed the stock index futures market uh, in China uh, just uh, literally a week ago. Uh, as of two months ago, you know, the stock index futures market in China was the biggest uh, in the world. And then as of this Monday, uh, its trading volume uh, declined by about 99%. Uh, so no matter how you look at it, right, so politics can actually uh, be very effective if they want to uh, have an impact uh, either for some financial innovations to uh, fail uh, or to die or for others to uh, succeed. Uh, so how do we, uh, of course, I, I first have to realize, I have to say that uh, 
uh, really, I, they, there's not much research on the politics of uh, financial innovation, so this may be something uh, worth doing uh, going forward. Um, so uh, this recent episode reminds me of um, the, uh, the International Advisory Board meeting we had uh, in Beijing uh, for the uh, CSRC, uh, so the Chinese SEC counterpart. Uh, during the last meeting of that uh, advisory board meeting, actually our favorite, uh, Bill Donaldson, is also on that same board, and he was there at the, at the same time with me. So the chairman of the CSRC asked uh, everyone uh, in the room, you know, how can we convince our leaders that uh, futures markets, in particular stock index futures, actually add any value, uh, actually are important uh, for China and for other countries. So that showed you know, what was on his mind because he had a tough time convincing uh, the premier and uh, other vice, uh, many vice premiers why those futures markets should continue in China. So that was last uh, November. So in response to his question, I, I gave him some advice. I don't know whether it worked or not. Well, of course, it did not work. Uh, now we know. Um, <laughs> uh, I said, uh, well, you know, uh, here is one example you can use uh, because, uh, you know, there's a Yale professor, Mark Rosenzweig. Uh, he did some research on uh, Indian uh, parents uh, in, 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 you know, India, in the different villages. Uh, who would like to marry, uh, ma marry their daughters as far away as possible. The reason is, you know, the, the crop failures are not so, I mean, are much less highly correlated uh, the more distant two villages are from each other. So by sending their daughters and, uh, to families very far away, they can use, uh, can, they can achieve a lot of uh, crop, uh, crop failure risk diversification. Uh, so marriage is, uh, serve a good purpose, right, to, to mitigate uh, the risks, uh, the impact of, uh, of uh, uh, harvest uh, failures. But of course, you know, the daughter's marriage, so their happiness are really sacrificed. So now you don't need to do that. With futures contracts and other financial derivatives, you don't need to marry your daughter with a risk mitigation in mind. <laughs> uh, rather, those financial contracts will just do it for you. Uh, so the chairman was pretty happy to hear this. Um, and then, of course, uh, I did not hear from him, but, but last week, nonetheless, they decided to kill this futures market. So this uh, um, uh, brings us back to this more general question. Uh, how much does politics uh, uh, play in terms of uh, its role uh, in financial innovation, success, and uh, failures. Uh, the other day when uh, the finance faculty were having lunch together, we all mentioned that uh, Napoleon uh, um, uh, used to uh, be uh, so against short selling. So it did not actually uh, take all the way uh, to today for China to imprison short sellers and uh, call short sellers uh, uh, traders uh, to the country or very, uh, you know, they are so unpatriotic. They even want to sell uh, Chinese stocks short. Actually, Napoleon was uh, way ahead of Chinese leaders more than 200 years ago. He decided to make short selling uh, also illegal uh, and uh, imprisoned uh, many of them. Then as recent as 1995, uh, the, you know, the Malaysian finance minister said, uh, uh, those short sellers should be caned, right, as a punishment. Uh, so, so, of course, in the U.S. back in 2008, uh, then a short selling ban uh, was imposed here. Uh, so that's uh, on the short selling side. We don't necessarily call that financial innovation, but you, in the larger scheme of things, uh, that's uh, really uh, something, uh, you know, if you view it as a big package, uh, view financial innovation as a big package, uh, it's uh, part of the uh, designs, right? And then uh, historically, of course, I, I don't have time to go through a lot of things, but just quickly, I want to mention two examples. Uh, one uh, is uh, junk bonds, right? Uh, so we, we all remember in the 1980s, uh, Jackson Burnham, uh, together with uh, uh, Michael Milken, 
they really made uh, junk bonds so popular uh, in the uh, 1980s uh, to facilitate and uh, make possible um, hostile takeovers. Uh, of course, they did so much damage uh, uh, to the uh, management uh, uh, community of various corporations. So the political pressure was really high. Of course, for, there were other reasons for Jackson Burnham to fail and also for Michael Milken to be imprisoned. Uh, but I think the political pressure uh, really played a big role. So as a result, after uh, 1990, with uh, both uh, Jackson Burnham and uh, Michael Milken, uh, you know, being uh, more or less uh, imprisoned or, or disappearing through bankruptcy, uh, then uh, from the early 90s onward, uh, junk bonds became such a bad name. So it became almost uh, a financial instrument that nobody wanted to be associated with or use in terms of the naming. Uh, and then as a result of that uh, political uh, movement, uh, if I can say it that way, then uh, the, from the early 90s onward, uh, a total opposite reversal to some extent happened. So junk bonds uh, became totally unpopular politically and socially. Then in, in their place, um, securitization uh, came in as a way to help uh, Enron. Uh, many of you know, you know securitization first was introduced by Jeannie May in 1970, but that was really for the mortgage market. And then in 1985, uh, around that time, auto loans became uh, uh, the ne next uh, uh, group to be uh, securitized against. Uh, but for corporate financing, uh, it took all the way until Enron uh, to pick that up because I guess around 1990, uh, Enron realized that uh, now junk bonds uh, are, are so out of favor politically. What are we going to do? So we, we, they, they realized that securitization uh, that comes with uh, off-balance sheet arrangements uh, and uh, bankruptcy remote structural arrangements, all those designs offered uh, to make uh, securitized uh, instruments huh, uh, so safe, uh, almost too much. Too, much, too many safety guards and uh, uh, insurance uh, and various guarantees that came with them. So that helped uh, corporate America in the 1990s uh, to find this new way of uh, uh, financing or raising capital to help them. But of course, unfortunately, in 2001, uh, Aaron uh, had his own problems. Uh, so that led uh, to the more or less uh, this uh, decline, if not uh, demise, of uh, securitization uh, uh, used by corporations to raise capital. Of course, then uh, in 2007, the sub, uh, subprime crisis did not really help either. Uh, so to some extent, even though today you know, securitization is still uh, being used uh, in various ways, especially by financial institutions, in the corporate world, uh, it, it's no longer that popular. Uh, so I, you know, I'm using quite a few examples to really make a simple point. So politics and political uh, social uh, pressures uh, tend to, uh, in many cases, uh, uh, make, it, uh, make life e uh, either uh, easier or very hard uh, for financial innovators. Uh, um, and then I guess uh, uh, for us doing research, so this is a topic that we have totally overlooked. Uh, uh, so as financial innovators, uh, sometimes we do want to keep in mind whether what you are introducing will be uh, uh, popular from the left or, uh, or popular from the right. And then if you want to go neutral, go neutral in the middle, right, then you may want to design your uh, new financial securities or contracts just in the right way so that you get support from uh, both the left and the right. Otherwise, uh, you should uh, be prepared that um, your, your innovation may not have an infinite amount of time to uh, survive. Okay, so I should stop here. Okay, um, uh, I'm Ling Feng. my name is Ling Feng. I graduated from here in 2003, and PhD from economics, and I, uh, I'm really glad to be, to be back here and also have my two mentors sitting there, uh, Will Gitzman and uh, Gil Runhorst. Um, I, um, I was um, at Yale around the uh, end of the 90s and the beginning of the uh, 2000s. So the one of the 
most interesting topic we look at at the time was uh, this uh, Asian financial crisis, how the currency, uh, currency of this country blew up. Um, so uh, after graduate, after having my degree, um, it's kind of into this world of uh, hedge funds. So lived in New York, lived in London. So a year ago, a year, um, we moved back to the family, moved back to, to Hong Kong. So start to look a little closer at the emerging market. There's something really interesting, really strange that caught my mind. Because back in the 90s, if you, you know, study Asian financial crisis, there's a few sterilized facts about these countries that really blew up, right? IMF kind of wrote a tons of papers, an academic wrote a tons of papers about this. One of the few things, you look for the symptom for a weak currency, weak country. One is uh, the current account. It's, it's like looking at, kind of looking at a person, a, co a company, a current account is in deficit. So you're rolling down, so instead of making money, you're drawing down, you know, making a salary, you're actually paying someone else salary, you're drawing down your, your, your savings. And the other thing is uh, the uh, reserve has to, has to come down pretty fast so that you cannot defend your currency. The other one, <coughs> is, the other one measure is uh, the short-term debt. The short-term debt uh, lending from, uh, you know, the borrowing from the uh, international banking community is another thing that can get these currencies into, get countries into trouble. So last year, when I started looking at emerging market, the currency of some of these country, countries just started to go. What, what that mean is that, for example, a major currency like a Korean won has uh, depreciated by 20% from last year to this year. At 20% for, and then, and then Malaysian ringgit, which is sort of a, the, the postal child of uh, Asian financial crisis in the late 90s lost 40% of its value in, the, in a year's time. And I started to question, I say, you know, this really looks strange because I look at either of the countries, their current account to GDP still running surplus, not just a little bit surplus, but tremendous surplus, 10% of GDP, 10% of uh, uh, surplus to, to, to GDP. Then you look at the reserve. Some of these countries, for example, Korea has a still have about 370 billion in reserve, and they're still accumulating reserves. And they're running, not running down reserves, they're accumulating reserves. Malaysia may have a little bit of problem, but they still have about 100 billion in the war chest. And then you look at the other thing is a short-term funding. The, the, global, uh, the global banking sector is no longer the main player in funding these countries anymore because hey, we had a financial crisis in 2008, and the Europeans and the American banks just all scaled back. B, there are these, uh, these, uh, these rules that people are in place that make it extremely difficult and uh, costly for these banks to lend to, uh, to, to emerging market. So we, we see the same thing, which is the currency depreciation very fast. And at the same time, none of the symptoms IMF prescribed it and our traditional macroeconomists prescribed it happened. So, so I, you know, I brought that question to a lot of famous strategists on the street. No one could really answer the question. So, and then we said, I decided to take the hand, take the matter in my hands. So we did the, I had my analysts looking at studies, looking at these countries, and why, why the currency is depreciating and who are selling. And these are, um, so I brought you a few kind of facts over funding. So hopefully I get you interested. Number one. International, um, the developed world is still lending to, to, uh, to emerging market in massive scale, but not through banks anymore. The new channel is called asset management. It's the PIMCO of the world, it's the Franklin Templeton of the world, it's the Ashman of the world, right? So these guys, the, no, the good thing about it is it's not short-term funding. The, the problem with it is massive, right? For the, you know, let's take Malaysia again as an example. Malaysia is the, f the bond market is owned by f about forty-four percent is owned by the uh, by bond by foreigners. That went up. It was started about ten percent, eight seven eight years ago, just right after the financial crisis. Uh, Indonesia is much higher, and then for countries like Thailand and Korea, they are like in the in the twenties, twenty percent. So, um, so no, one time I think emerging market bond investment was. Very, very popular. But still, that's what the, not a source of the problem because of this, these are long-term bonds and they cannot just pull it overnight. Then we look at it and then, you know, if you, a current account does not help you answer the question, there has to be the capital account. It's just the flip page, the flip side of a current account, right? So we look at it is item by item. Certainly, uh, the uh, portfolio investment, Koreans just turn it into from an intake of, a, of a investment 
to to uh, to uh, uh, someone who invests heavily outside the country. Um, Korea, you know, Korea stocks used to be the you know the famous value trap of the world, and it's 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 cheap, and you invest, and no one makes money. Um, but now the Koreans are investing heavily outside. The f foreign, uh, the FDI, you know, clearly uh, the uh, Korean companies invest heavily outside as well. Now, that's not yet the most interesting, fascinating part of this one, our investigation was uh, this, this item called other investment. No one could really figure out, I mean, a lot of economists and strategists couldn't figure out what is other investment. Other investment will count for, you know, in Korea, it probably count for 30% of the outflow, in China, 9 out of 60, 40, 50, 60 percent of the outflow. So we took that into to bureau, statistics bureau. We took to uh, the pe people who crank the number. In, in the end, we figure out what is that? It's the, for most part, it's the currency and deposit in the banking sector that domestic residents are actively converting their own currency to foreign currencies. Now I say, maybe the country like China has a, has a capital control, you can't really do that. Mm, not really. Corporates, has a corporates of the of size of China can can a lot of leeways. China runs about 500 billion uh, uh, surplus a year, current account. That's a, you know, roughly, it's a 200, there's 2.5 trillion of uh, imports versus two trillion, uh, no, 2.5 trillion of exports versus two trillion of imports, just for example. If you have 10% of exporters want to delay the payment, that's 250 billion of less intake of a foreign currency. If you have importers decide to advance the payment, if they have a hold a different view of their own currency, that's another 200 billion. Together, it's 450 billion. That offsets, quote unquote, 500 billion of uh, surplus people have. So, so the, the key of the, all these country, the problem with the currency now become a little bit clear, it's within the domestic sector. So why, the, the, the question is why are domestic actively converting the currency uh, to, uh, to, to foreign currencies? And it turns out, you know, we look at it, it was compared to about 15 years ago, so these countries have a new problem. In the past, the old problem was, sorry, we're not making enough money from export. Sorry, we couldn't make the ends meet. We, we borrow too much. Right now, the problem is not they borrow too much. It's not they making not enough money. It is the domestic investment opportunity is less. It's far less, far less attractive. Domestics are always the first one to know the country. It's not George Soros of the world. It's not, it's not a hedge fund of the world. It's almost, always, almost the domestics. So domestic look at it. The, the business model, old business model, was very simple. China's growing, export to China, and then China will export to the rest of the world to, to the US, which is running on credit. Now, on the funding side, you just get the cheap credit, cheap funding from European, from Americans. That's simple. So you, this is the leverage. Fast growing on one side, cheap funding on another side. In the last two or three years, this thing started to reverse. US enter, Federal Reserve entered tapering, so it took out the QE, now we're about to hike rates. On the other side, China is a slowing very rapidly. So this, is business, this old business model is completely working in reverse. And each country couldn't figure out what to do with it. So it's not a funding problem, it's not an income problem, it's an investment problem. So what's the implication, we'll, you know, we'll talk a bit, uh, a bit on China, but what's the implication for, the, for these countries before they sort out this is like 15 years ago, we have acute disease. You need to put a bandit on there, they will, you know, this, this person will, will recover. Right now, it's more of a chronic problem. And they need to go deep down to look at the growth model to see what are they can develop a, a new advantage, the new edge for the economy to grow again. Otherwise, currency depreciation will be the only, only way out. And then that's not a, and that's not a pleasant situation because once current, one currency depreciates, that makes the other currency uh, more expensive. Then we go into this downward spiral. Now, um, for small countries, you can figure this out from the economics model. For major country, not so simple because the major country a lot of leeways. And then one thing is, uh, if your real exchange rate needs to depreciate, right? The two ways to go. One is uh, just devalue the, the normal exchange rate. 
Another thing that happens is if you hold it, if you, for whatever reason you hold the nominal exchange rate very strong, then what's going to happen is that your inflation level is going to start to come down. So you, first you enter disinflation, meaning the inflation CPI level goes, growth goes lower, and in the end you enter a world that's called deflation. That's not a nice place to be. And Japan has demonstrated the last 20 years it took so much inertia to, to knock out deflation. So, uh, so uh, you know, but in the, in the last month, we see that the biggest, uh, the elephant in the room, China finally made the move that depreciated the currency by, by 3%. Uh, my calculation is shows um, the currency is still way too expensive. And I cannot guarantee that you know, this, they're gonna actively depreciate the currency. Like I said, for major countries, they got, uh, they got leeways, right? It could, we end up in a world that's gonna be closer to Japan, it's not nice, and I hope the policy makers underst understand that. But for everyone in the room, it's a new problem. We'll probably get our chance to write some new papers. <laughs> okay. Dean? Uh, okay, so I'm gonna be a little bit different. <laughs> um, so as, as James mentioned, my background, um, my, my main area of work is in developing countries, but on the other end of the spectrum is working with um, poor households, smallholder farmers, micro entrepreneurs, or just you know any any individual um, living two dollars a day and below. Now, um, there, what's exciting that's going on in this space is a tremendous amount of innovation. There are um, so I, I just literally landed last night and got home at 1:30 in the morning from a conference in Turkey with the G20 that was exactly on innovation in financial inclusion for the world poor and specifically talking about the digital kind of explosion that's happening. Um, and I think, I'm gonna sound a little academic now, but I think it's very useful to put this in terms of academic context. And there's a lot of, a lot of this, the people at this conference, I think uh, it actually frames very nicely like a kind of big picture sense on what are the main issues and what am, what am I most concerned about as kind of a, a little bit of an outsider to the space in the sense that I won't work directly in it as an actual actor, but just I'm studying it. And so the, what's my main concern? Um, and I think it's helpful to start off as an academic um, with a little bit of theory. Why, you know, why, why are there conferences on issues about financial inclusion? Well, it's because markets are not working. That if markets were working in it, then there would be no need, there would never be gatherings. We didn't. You know, the example I used in that conference was there's no corollary conference in the hotel next door on candy and trying to figure out how we need to, what we need to do to improve candy for the world's poor around the world. Um, so what is it about the market for financial inclusion that leads to market failures? Well, if you think through the four assumptions that, that are behind efficient markets, every one of them is kind of screwed in the financial inclusion space for the poor. Um, but three of them are getting a lot better, and that's what's exciting. We're, we're seeing a lot of innovation to improve three. And the fourth, I think, needs work. That's what I'll explain. Uh, the first, transaction costs. Right? This is the, the single easiest way of explaining where mobile money has huge power for improving the way finance can be used to help the world's poor move money around. When we think about what we do with finance, think about finance for the household perspective as the ability to move money from here to there as a payment, to move money from now to the future, savings, to move money from the future to now, borrowing, to move money from now to moments that are bad for me, insurance, right? It's all about moving money from one place to another, whether that place is over time, geographic, or just over states of, states of affairs and risk. That's, there's transaction costs in doing that. If you're poor, living in a really rural area, those transaction costs were so high as to render them impossible, a total market failure, right? And then the only way you could do things was completely informal mechanisms, like investing in a cow, which then can get sick and die, um, and things of this nature. So you see lots of second best solutions being tried over you know, centuries and centuries that are not as effective. And so when we see digital finance take off the way it is and the ability to actually take just a couple dollars and, and for almost no money whatsoever, make a deposit and withdrawal, that's, that's incredibly exciting. It's also incredibly scary, for a reason I'm gonna to get to in the fourth assumption on um, perfect uh, on rationality. So remember, zero transaction cost is being both exciting and scary. <laughs> um, so it's exciting because, well, it, um, 
the idea of, of people being able to do those transactions for free means that there's transactions that, that they can do that they wouldn't otherwise do. What's the second assumption? It's information asymmetries, or none therein, right? That we have perfect information. So here, again, we're seeing tremendous innovation transforming this space. So there were people in this conference who's, who were using call phone data, cell phone data from the telecom to credit score to then figure out what's the right price um, loan to issue these different people. And you can use, there's a lot of information you can get from cell phone data and the regularity with which once someone tops up and also from mobile money, the regularity with which they make transfers, incoming, outgoing, can all be used to do risk-based pricing. That's just econ 101 for more efficient markets because now they can do risk-based pricing and people who otherwise were not able to get loans can now get loans. There's a world of other things in that space um, also that have to do with moral hazard and reduction of moral hazard. When, when payments are all being done digitally rather than in cash, it reduces the ability for someone to renege on a contract to repay. So the extent that contracts aren't taking place in the first place, loans, because of the inability of the lender to collect money, making it so that they can reduce the risk of a moral hazard obviously makes it more possible for firms to lend to individuals and transactions to happen and markets to work. So seeing this kind of space of world data and digital platforms for payments radically reduces information asymmetries, again, can um, improve markets. The third is a trickier one. This is one that got uh, the most um, controversy at this conference, because you had telecom there, you had regulators there, and you had banks there. These three groups do not get along so well in a lot of conversations, and it all comes down to a basic issue of competition. There is a natural monopoly in a lot of situations for telecom, um, and when telecom immediately moves into mobile money space and starts becoming and behaving like a bank, the banks don't like that too much. Right? And so then they want, to, they want to see them regulated the same way they're regulated, shut them down. But ideally, from, a, from an economist perspective, as an outsider, we look at it and we go, no, we just want competition. That's just, again, like what are the basic principles behind, behind perfect markets? The third one is perfect competition. So if, we're not, if it's not natural to have perfect competition because of the market structure, and the, I'm sorry, the cost structure of firms where there's actually economies of scale um, to make it so that a natural monopoly is efficient, then that's an obvious space where you do need some regulation to come in um, and, and make it so that parties can properly compete. Okay, so those three are all kind of addressable and on the table, um, and we're seeing tremendous progress on the first two and, and kind of people thinking hard about how to deal with the, the third. The fourth is perfect rationality for consumers. So this is a trickier one, right? We can, lower, we can do work to lower transaction costs, this is a technological innovation. We can do work through lower information asymmetry, through better use of data, better contracting, things like that. We can do work to improve competition by proper regulation. We cannot change human nature. Right? We cannot just say, oh, people usually don't pay attention to all the things they need to pay attention to, so let's just change human nature and make them pay attention. Um, or people succumb to temptation, so let's come, you know, maybe, the, maybe someone will innovate and come up with a pill you can take to resist temptation. Maybe that's, maybe that's in the works. But for the most part, we gotta work around that one. We gotta figure out how to solve the problem in spite of human nature, not changing human nature. Um, and that's an area where there's tremendous potential for innovation in the way products are designed. Like the website that James mentioned that I started called Stick is an example of work, trying to help people find workarounds that despite they're succumbing to temptation, they stay on track and achieve a goal by uh, aligning incentives to where they want to be. I want to lose weight, I align my incentives so I can lose weight, I want to save more, I align my incentives accordingly. And that's a, it's a website built around helping people do just that. So that's one where we have to accept the beast as it is of human nature and figure out how to design products to help people achieve the goals, achieve the things that they would say they want to achieve in a moment of deep reflection and informed reflection. And the, and the two issues that I think most often come up when we talk about financial uh, management of households are about attention and temptation. Attention to all the future expenditures one needs to be saving for so that when you're saving, you don't undersave. Um, attention and temptation typically has to do with just failure to plan. The kind of the, the, the long-term things that, that you wanna save for are long run, but right now in the here and now, there's some kind of neat things I wanna buy. And maybe it's a watch, maybe it's clothing, maybe it's a fancy meal, maybe it's a fancy vacation, and then, but inevitably, or, or if someone's on, on the poorer side in a developing country, we'll see the same kind of context with um, 
with you know regretted spending on things like household furniture where then they don't have enough money for um, for fertilizer for their farm. And in a moment of deep reflection, they would say, yeah, 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 I'm better off holding back on buying that table um, and then investing in fertilizer and having two tables in a year. Um, but things things get in the way. Um, there's also um, um, so yeah. So that's you know two of the issues that if you design products around how people really behave, then those are ways of addressing those basic issues. So. Great, thank you. So uh, we'll open up to questions now from the audience. Uh, yes. Uh, and the mics should be going around. If you just wait for the mic to get to you. Hi, thank you very much for your comments. My name is Lori Cameron. I'm in the EMBA class of 2016. Dr. Chen is one of my professors, I'm lucky to say. Um, my question is actually to um, Dr. Lee or Mr. Lee in a continuation of a conversation we had at the beginning of this and your discussion about currencies, um, emerging markets, currencies being devalued and that being sort of a necessary lever and sort of makes sense in the world of falling oil prices that the oil importers don't need a strong dollar anymore, so that would be a natural reaction. There's been a lot of press recently about the dollar, about massive dollar amounts of um, debt issued by emerging markets economies. And what this brings to mind to me is when I look at economies like Turkey, Brazil, South Africa, the former Soviet bloc, Russia, I don't think there's mentioned what their current account deficit is. All these countries have current account deficits in excess of 4%. They also have a massive amount of dollar financing, and this is most, mostly in the corporate sector. Um, but a depreciating currency would cause 1998, I guess, sort of all over again, um, which is, is something that worries me looking into the future and thinking what the future might hold. And I would be so grateful for any comments that you would have in that regard of whether governments are aware of the dollar funding some of the corporations have and the magnitude uh, especially in those economies with the current account deficits in excess of 4%. Okay, uh, I think it is, um, um, what I just spent time on is probably more of the Asian, Asian countries, current Asian countries. And then when you more concerned about like the, uh, what they call, the, 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 the fragile pits. five, or the fragile four, I mean the, the, the new term, the, the, the uh, South Africa, Turkey, Brazil, Russia, right? Now, I think these four countries, and then probably a group of countries around that, having the same problem that these Asians have in the mid-90s, right? These Asians have, is more of a, I would call it the richer version. They're just, because they, over time, they have to grow a lot richer, and then they're more, more of a, is an asset side of the problem. And you, what you describe is more of the liability side of the problem. And I don't know whether they're aware of it, and even if they're aware of it, I don't know how much they could do. Frankly, in the international finance world, uh, small countries are very constrained in their options. A major country like the United States and the, and the EU could do QE. Turkey's not gonna do, come to QE. No one's gonna believe them. Malaysia can't do QE. No one's gonna believe them, right? The, the, the moment they do QE, the country's gonna blow up. So the small countries have a limited amount of limited amount of leeways, and uh, if the corporates, I actually not, have not looked into the uh, corporates uh, uh, US debt issue. Uh, I think a lot of it is actually bank lending. The, the Asians are the ones that issue a lot of dollar debt. In th these Asian countries, you put them in aggregate, I mean, the, you put the government resources, the local, the corporates, or the resident sector together, and they're not, they don't really have an, uh, a, a debt problem. Right, they are aggregate. They are the creditor, not the debtor, to the U.S. Right, but it doesn't mean they have no. They don't have a problem. It disaggregate different sectors it has a problem. So that's why they they're depreciating because in the private sector, we're trying to get rid of their own currency. Now the fragile five has a somewhat different problem. I think they have the they have a nineties problem. The Asians have another level of the richer set of richer people's problem. Yeah. 
sorry, in, in that regard then, um, going back to the Chinese currency devaluation, I was very surprised that it was only 3% when you think of the magnitude of the reserves that are held in, in foreign, in dollars, in euros, um, every percentage point. It, when their currency floats, if it starts to float up, they're gonna need a much more significant depreciation, right, to compensate for the loss in their value of the reserves. So a, a, any thoughts on any potential policy related to that would be really appreciated as well. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think for the reserve managers, um, they, they're looking at things very differently from us. They're not necessarily mark to market their portfolio in a different currency, right? If the mandate is to run the current, run the, run the portfolio in US dollars, they have US dollars, right? Um, so um, just like when they're appreciating, they're not counting as a, as a, as a profit. When they're depreciating, they're not counting as loss. Okay, uh, gentlemen, Darren, thank you. Question for Professor Carlin. Uh, what role do you see uh, in, for microfinance to, democrat to further democratize financial access, large, medium, small, can it grow, practical limits to growth? Sure, um, so, so I think it's key to separate out microfinance into two spaces. There's microcredit, which is, um, and then there's the other components of finance, savings and insurance. Um, so I'm not sure, were you focused on one in particular, or, or a lot of times people say microfinance when we're talking about microcredit. Um, so the credit side has, so um, part of what I didn't talk about is a lot of the work that um, James alluded to is a nonprofit I started called Innovations for Poverty Action, which runs randomized trials to figure out what works and what doesn't in developing countries. This is the core of my academic work as well as doing this. Microcredit has been grossly oversold for decades, um, um, but it is still good. It's something investors should be fi fine with and happy with because the critics of microcredit have also overstated their, their territory quite a bit as well. Um, having said that, it is not lifting millions out of poverty, right? It's doing good work, um, expanding people's choices. In a typical market, only 20% of people participate, so it's clearly not satisfying the needs of a lot of people. That 20% does not include the poorest, so it's leaving behind a huge proportion of people that are too poor for microcredit. Um, there's other work we've done which has found, through a grant program, sustainable impacts up to seven years later from a, a, an integrated package of, uh, that's a grant-based program rather than a credit-based program. So there are ways of dealing with the ultra-poor that, that are proven much more successful in lifting, lifting people out of poverty. The exciting part, and this is why I broke off my question to you, the exciting part, in my view, is on the, the other parts of the finance. The credit's all fine and well, and we should let it happen and let investors go and do it and hope and do what we can to make the markets work there better so that investors can do that more seamlessly. Um, it's a, not a space for donors though. I don't think people should be writing charitable checks to microcredit organizations anymore. They did a great job getting the industry started, but now they're fine. But the finance space, doing work to help innovate on savings, to make savings products better, that requires a lot more work, has tremendous, a lot more promise, and it's certainly not as costly for the poor because they're not spending you know, 40% APR on a loan, they're just earning interest. Maybe it's low interest, but at least it's, it's not paying. So savings has a lot more promise, um, and insurance, I think, has a lot more promise in terms of ways to have bigger impacts on, on, on issues of fighting poverty. But I think the, you know, the overriding theme is, of, in terms of that, is um, that I would leave with you guys is not to, not to take away any particular lesson about what worked and what done, didn't, but to take away the idea that rather than um, kind of Read, it, read an interesting article that sounds exciting about something um, that you know, we need evidence. Um, and lots of things that don't sound great actually work and are quite more effective than things that might sound great. And the, you know, kind of the rhetorical power of the spokesperson is not what we should be following, yet that is what it follows. Um, the uh, kind of the hedge fund world tends to, that, um, that we see on the philanthropic side tends to be much more in tune with the idea of using the same kind of hard-nosed principles that they use in investment Let's use that in philanthropy and let's go and figure out what works and what doesn't and fund those things and don't fund the things that don't um, in a much more kind of analytically rigorous kind of approach. Um. Yes, sir. 
Thank you. I, I wanted to ask you about uh, both uh, Dr. Chen and Dr. Lee about uh, the, remim the renminbi, uh, because many of the commentators in the financial media uh, talk about the Chinese devaluation as if it was double digits. And as you said, I mean, it was 3%. It's been fluctuating 2 to 3% uh, from below from where it was pre-devaluation. Uh, pre Do you think it was really a devaluation, or is it really more part of the whole process of getting it included in the SDR basket of the IMF? And how do you see the trend going forward for the currency? You want to okay, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little. Um, <laughs> from my, what I know, they're trying to achieve. Um, um, it's interesting. There's a lot of private conversation going on. I think they, they, they were playing a little cheeky uh, in the beginning. So they wanted to satisfy. They thought they had a genius idea of uh, depreciating by 3% so that they can both satisfy the SDR rule, the IMF uh, recommendation, and also devalue the currency a little bit. And at the same time, blame that all on the S uh, CSRC, which is China version of the SEC. And then this is uh, uh, what they call ministerial politics. They, they thought they have a genius idea and they realized all the problems are now in their hands. So yeah, um, what it really triggered, what it smart money has been doing over the last few years, is finding ways to move money outside the country. But what it really triggered this time is everyone else who has been uh, been slow in this train realize this is not a one-way train anymore. We have uh, one of uh, our you know famous alumni, I'm not going to name, running a huge fund uh, that basically has been borrowing you know, uh, you know his assets U.S. dollar his U.S. is all Chinese com companies and he's invested all U.S. based. So I met him late July, and he's asking me, so what are we going to do with this? And uh, it's a 3% uh, uh, hedging cost or too much. And I'll say, you really have to do something about it. Uh, you know, this is running, you guys are running a uh, 10 billion fund, right? So the, over time, it's worked really well. There's a, and the exercise is appreciating, right? Now everything in reverse. So a lot of those, what I call, the slow hedging needs comes up, and which is what now it's challenging uh, the uh, the central bank. So I, I think they are very you know very uh, very delicate situation. And then yesterday they had a, one of the biggest actually last night they had one of the biggest intervention. I don't know I don't exactly know where this is going to go. I think I will believe the economic force is far more greater than what they could do, but they believe in the short term they want a stabil stabilization. Do they have, like I said, major countries have a lot of leeways. They ought to have a lot of uh, political goals. That's different from uh, what they could achieve, they can achieve with economics. And yeah, I, I think the, the timing and the magnitude of this uh, recent devaluation uh, can, can also be understood in, 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 uh, in the following way. First, um, you know, President Xi will make his uh, first state visit to the U.S. on the 20th of September. So the central bank in China and others uh, can, should not do anything to meta, mess up this uh, atmosphere. So they, the, if they wanted to devalue the renminbi, they would have to uh, do it uh, way in advance enough uh, for the markets to react and so on. So that's why uh, you know, August 11th happened to be that time. And then secondly, the Chinese economy, especially the export uh, sector, really was showing a lot of uh, signs of uh, weakness. Uh, the state council uh, wanted to respond uh, in some way. And uh, so on Ju July 30th, uh, the state council more or less issued a statement trying to signal that they would like to help uh, the export sector uh, in order to avoid um, more free fall in the uh, employment uh, situation. So that created sort of another need um, for some uh, action. And then in terms of the magnitude, uh, internally and privately, yeah, they, they like this gradual approach for devaluation, so about 3% but no more than 5% a year uh, going forward, maybe for some number of years. Uh, uh, so, and then at the same time, they were totally aware of uh, 
U.S. senators and congressmen always standing in, uh, standing there ready to criticize China for manipulating the currency. So if uh, the renminbi uh, continues uh, to uh, devalue, uh, depreciate uh, for a number of years and for, uh, by large amounts, then they could not handle all the pressure from Washington. So three or five percent um, a year is something uh, that maybe politically they, they can handle uh, without uh, you know uh, damaging the U.S.-China relations too much. Yeah. Uh, Professor so, so Chen, for, I mean, for that reason, for the next one month, I guess uh, don't expect uh, any depreciation news to come out of uh, the renminbi exchange market. Yeah, yeah Professor Chen, uh, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, you know politics affects uh, financial innovations. And particularly China, you correctly mentioned that you know they almost closed the futures market. Well, they almost closed the even cash market, I guess, a while ago. But do you expect this to be a temporary measure, or you think um, somehow eventually they will get back on the road of uh, uh, you know uh, development and opening? I think the commodities futures markets uh, will continue. Uh, they do understand. Uh, that uh, the commodities futures markets are important for China to uh, have more control over the pricing of uh, key commodities that China relies on uh, so much. Uh, and also the commodities markets are more like the professionals uh, uh, game. Uh, not many average guys uh, really uh, take part in the trading of those commodities futures. So this is why uh, politics does not get involved as much, but stock index futures, I would say, uh, at least for the next few years, is unlikely to come back. Come back in life, uh, at least uh, you know if the current CSRC chairman stays on, and all, uh, I'm almost certain that he will not want to touch this uh, game. Uh, in fact, last uh, summer participated in some of the internal meetings about the introduction of uh, stock index options. Uh, it's very interesting, you know, they, the whole research team for the CSRC tried to make the argument uh, for the introduction of uh, stock index futures by saying, you know, investors can actually, on average, uh, make higher returns uh, if they use uh, stock options, stock index options, and I said, oh, no, no, that's the wrong way to make the argument. <laughs> okay, stock index futures, especially put options, they're really like insurance products first. They're not investment instruments to begin with. They're more for insurance purposes. You know, just like we don't ask insurance companies to give us uh, positive expected returns when we buy insurance policies. We expect to suffer a loss on average. Uh, so stock index futures, uh, in that sense, uh, when uh, looked at um, you know, as uh, insurance products first, then uh, we should be fine even in the long term, the expected return from options is negative because they are for insurance purposes. Uh, they get some, uh, they, they like the, my, my, my perspective and then, uh, but I, I think uh, both uh, the stock index futures and stock index options may be tabled for now. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, you know, it's very interesting if we look at uh, this conference, right, from t yesterday to today, I would say um, those financial innovations uh, promoted by uh, Professor Colin and also uh, Bob Schiller are easily politically uh, popular, no problem. So don't worry about politics making them popular. But the types of financial innovations uh, proposed or liked, I guess, by, uh, as an example, by Wilbur Ross are likely to be politically unpopular. So this is why hedge funds, right? Hedge funds have always been struggling for, uh, for the right, uh, right name and right reputation because hedge funds are mostly to serve uh, wealthy people. You have to have certain amount of income. But on the other hand, uh, microfinance, I'm for microfinance, so that's, uh, that's not a problem. But, but on the other hand, it's very interesting to compare the kind of reception up to this point to your, to your digital finance and uh, uh, inclusive finance 
uh, and compare that this reception to uh, how uh, payday loans have been treated, right? You know, payday loans uh, are also inclusive financial innovations or, or institutions. Of course, uh, then we'll say, well, they charge too much, but that's a different technical issue, right? But their whole social, political uh, uh, attitudes or hostility uh, towards um, uh, usury for many centuries and now towards payday loans uh, uh, have been sort of separate, treated totally separately uh, from uh, today's um, uh, inclusive uh, digital finance. But I guess maybe there may be a point when uh, those uh, financial institutions that have to charge high enough in order to overcome the extra transaction costs that come with a small lending but vast number of lending transactions, then the, 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 the social political uh, attitudes may, may be different. But of course, the, the zero transaction cost and the much reduced asymmetric information will, will, help, will help reduce uh, the, uh, the required uh, level of interest uh, for such uh, financial uh, players to really uh, be uh, viable, yeah. Okay, well, we've come to the end of the time for this session, so please join me Did in I use all the time? Sorry. Yes, our speakers. Thank you. No, I, I have a...